Hey y'all, and welcome back to Bourbon and Bones. If you're one, if you are new to our channel, welcome. And if you are one of our faithful subscribers, welcome back. And if you like what we're doing here, like, comment, share, subscribe. You know, all the things you're supposed to do on YouTube. Tonight we're going to look at a staple in many cabinets, and that is going to be Bullet Bourbon. This here is the standard offering from Bullet, and there's also a 10-year-old, a barrel proof, several special editions that they've produced, a rye, and store selects, and all of those coming in different proof points. The story of Bullet is far older than most people realize, including myself. When I first started doing the research on this, I assumed that Bullet was only about 20, 30 years old. Come to find out, Thomas E. Bullet, the current master distiller, tells that his great-great-grandfather was Augustus Bullet, who began producing a two-thirds rye and one-third corn whiskey back in the 1830s. August Bullet was a tavern keeper in Louisville, Kentucky, and he began producing a very high rye whiskey that today would be considered a rye whiskey, but in 1860, when he was transporting a shipment down to New Orleans, he vanished under mysterious circumstances. Unfortunately, he actually was never heard from again. And that was kind of the end of the bullet bourbon whiskey line. From there, his whiskey pretty much just vanished from history. And over 100 years after Augustus vanished, a descendant, his descendant Thomas Bullet, left a very profitable law career and risked everything and began in 1987 the Bullet Distilling Company. He began aging a high rye bourbon, 68% corn, 28% rye, and 4% malted barley. And for 10 years, he made their bourbon on a small scale until 1997, when former giant Seagram's bought the company, began to supplement a lot of their bourbon from their powerhouse, Four Roses. This is one of the worst kept secrets in the bourbon industry. And then in 2000, Diageo snatched them all up when Seagram's went uh, belly up, and it began to become one of the most powerful brands for Diageo. So after Diageo purchased Bullet, they shifted from Four Roses, and right now they're being sourced primarily from an unknown location. Apparently, Diageo is much better at keeping their secrets than Seagram's was. So in 2017, Diageo bought a plot of land and built the Bullet D Distilling Company where they're now producing bourbon and receiving some other spirits to help them with the demand. So the rye comes actually out of Illinois from MGP. Bullet is also featured at Diageo's kind of mecca, the old Stetzer Weller Distillery. The hard part of the job there is really the master blender, taking all the products from 10 different sources and coming up with a profile for the frontier bourbons that everyone is looking for. I think I failed to mention, actually, their unknown sources is 10 different sources. So trying to figure out exactly which one specifically it is, I don't know. I don't know if anybody really knows. I've, I did some digging for a little while, but uh, there's a lot of guesses out there. But actually knowing which one, or which 10, rather, it's impossible. It's, it's, quite, it's a heavily guarded secret for them. And because Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we also wanted to mention Ebony Major, the uh, master blender at Bullet. She is the first uh, woman, uh, person of color in the position. She is a, uh, a female uh, in the bourbon industry, which is pretty rare. And for someone to actually reach Bullet's master level, master blender level uh, with Diageo, and being a woman of color, she is she is broken many glass ceilings. Also this year in 2020, she released line from Bullet, the Blender Select Number no. One, and it's a blend of three of the 10 whiskeys that are used to make the Bullet lines. And it's a fantastic bottle to pick up, and we'll be on the show at some point, but this week we want to focus on the original. So let's dig into the bourbon. When you actually look at the bottle here, it's actually raised lettering, bullet bourbon, frontier whiskey. And what they mean by frontier is high rye, punchy, flavorful, just what you think cowboys are drinking, uh, having their saddlebags. And, and the bottle itself kind of looks like an old style bottle. Look like it would come right out of a saddlebag of a cowboy and they're sitting around the fireplace uh, doing, a, doing a cattle drive. Distilled in age, the Bully family tradition. Uh, this is a 90 proof, really good looking bottle, great color. I think it's always a really bold look on a shelf. It's a great looking bottle. So let's dig into the bourbon itself. This 
So on the nose, it's a little delicate. You think Frontier, you think a little bit more aggression on the nose. You get a nice green oak, good caramel. Little bit of vanilla. And the palette is really where this bourbon shines. It is bold dark fruits. Like, I don't want to say dark cherry, but it has a dark plummy kind of note to it. It's spicy, like baking spices. It has caramel, a little bit of like a dark brown sugar quality. It's just, it's a really full baking spice forward. I just, it's really spicy. I mean, I think that's what you want from a frontier bourbon. Nice and spicy, good dark fruit. Finish a little, a little short, but has this nice sweetness that kind of rounds off a lot of the heat from the spice. It's a little bit of cinnamon on the back end. So tried bullet neat. So now we're gonna take a quick little break and try with a bit of water. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to Bourbon and Bones. We're trying bullet with a little bit of water this time. So let's dig in. So this time there's a lot more on the nose. A lot more uh, fruitiness. I almost wanna say a little bit of banana with a little bit of cherry. Also a nice, a nice green oak instead of like a heavy char oak or an aged oak. It's very almost virgin oak. So now it's, it's very, very buttery. Like the, the viscosity really changes a lot. And it is all about the spices. It is clove and anise and kind of a smoky element. Um, and even now, like as, I'm fin as it's finishing, it is this vanilla spiciness that kind of just lingers on the palate. It's just, it's really, really changes, like a whole lot. Um, it's been a long time since I've had a bullet. It's been a couple of years, and so I'm kind of surprised at its change. So, before I go any further, real fast, let's do the verdict. Bullet, it is a staple in most cabinets because it is a staple bourbon. It is spicy, flavorful, complex enough for a daily drinker. I really kind of want to play this one with a few cocktails, kind of see how it does. I really think it's gonna, it's gonna bring a lot to the table. I think that if you were to try a bullet from before Diageo and now, I think that the blend now is gonna be more complex than maybe even what Four Roses was producing. Because when you look at some of the older tasting notes books, there were not great things said about it compared to now. And I think that Ebony is just producing, is blending an amazing product here. And I think anyone, anyone would be happy with this bottle. This is a great bottle. It's a great one to start with. It's a great one to kind of get into the high rise with. Yeah, it's a, it's a great bottle for me. So for our, our final transition this evening, we're not actually gonna talk about a specific fossil, but an individual man um, and to help catalog thousands of fossils. Lewis Rayfield Purnell Sr. Born April 5th, 1920 and died August 10th, 2001 at the age of 81 from cancer. Now Lewis Purnell was a true Renaissance man and he began his life in poverty in Maryland. He worked hard during the depression and helped his family survive. 
being a young black man, his access to education was tenuous at best. But in 1939, Purnell, Purnell left home and enrolled in the Pennsylvania Lincoln University and pursued a bachelor's degree in psychology. However, in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. Because of this, he joined the Civil Pilot Training Program and became the 124th licensed black pilot in the United States. During World War II, Purnell joined the first, first group of the Tuskegee Airmen and was a commissioned officer as a second lieutenant. He was later promoted to the first lieutenant and requested combat tours. Throughout the war, he flew 88 combat missions over Italy, North Africa, Sicily, and Germany and was awarded Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with eight, with eight oak leaf clusters. Try to say that one fast. His experiences as a fighter pilot would help him much later in life, even though he didn't know it yet. After the war, and with the new GI Bill, Purnell went to Lincoln University and to finish up his college degree and graduated in 1947. He moved to Washington, D.C. after this to pursue a graduate degree at Howard University in speech therapy. But with a growing family, Purnell floated around several government jobs and finally landed a temporary six-month job at the Museum of Natural History in the Division of Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany. And at the end of that six-month period, he was offered a permanent position. Over the next few years, he identified, cataloged, tagged, discovered, and rediscovered thousands of specimen, specimens of nautiloids and cephalopods, both of which we've covered here on the show. He also got an advanced degree. He also traveled the world doing oceanographic research in and around the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And in 1968, he published the catalog of the type of specimens of invertebrate fossils, an over 260 page reference book for the most extensive collection of paleobiological invertebrates that is still used today. I personally have actually used this catalog to determine a species that I have found. And actually the link is gonna be below to the catalog. This was a massive undertaking and not a singular effort. His supervisors tried to prevent his research from being printed and finally settled with writing the foreword, taking large portions of credit for themselves. And yes, quite frankly, it was because he was a black man in the 1960s. After he finished his research, he decided to change jobs. When he did change jobs, he finished his career there at the Air and Space Museum negotiating with the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, and he went on to make deals with every company that made stuff for astronauts. Anything that went into space, held by an astronaut, touched by one, used by, in one by training, was eventually donated, after their use, to the museum. He became the world's foremost expert on space suits and helmets. And to be fair, this is a very, very brief story of Purnell's life. And I encourage you to read more about this amazing man and everything he did for science and for us, particularly paleontology. In the link, in the comments below, you're actually, in the link below, links, not comments, there'll actually be a link to the uh, Natural History Museum's website that gives a much more detailed description of his life and everything he devoted to the, to the museums in Washington. I encourage you to read it. It's, it's, it's incredible everything he did. My friends, happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day this Monday. And remember Mr. Purnell and Miss Ebony and all those who've helped shape paleontology and bourbon. And always remember, share bourbon with someone. Good night.